Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Questioning a better way, one gracefully disruptive conversation at a time. where it's with um, the phenomenal humans that I've been introduced to and really have not yet met. Uh, we've had a couple conversations. It is our first time meeting in person, and we were connected through a friend. And you know how I feel about uh, connects to connects. Those are always my favorite. So we've got Janine in the house today to talk about Flex Gym Share. Um, she is going to talk about her journey as a female entrepreneur, um, some of the challenges that have come in, some of the successes, all of it. And we're even going to talk about how uh, this coronavirus is impacting the entrepreneurial situation. And, uh, you know, it's kind of this, uh, a larger entrepreneurial metaphor where, you know, things come in the audible and then usually some good innovation comes out of that. But before we go there, Janine, tell us, welcome. Um, give us your, the background, anything else you want to share? How'd you get here? Hi, yes, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Um, how did I get here? Wow, what a question. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's been 32 years of ups and downs. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been um, an entrepreneur um, since my mid-20s. Okay. And I think we've really hit our stride with, uh, with Flex Gym Share. Um, this is my second company that I founded. Okay. Did you, parents, is entrepreneurial family? A very, very business-oriented family. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. I got that from my parents at a real early age. Okay. A shout out to mom and dad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're... Tell us about, um, well, let, I mean, give us like college kind of history. Did you play sports by chance? Yeah, yeah, I've been a, an athlete um, my whole life. Um, basketball and volleyball are my two sports. Okay. I uh, went to University of Michigan, great, oh. great 10 uh, sports school there. Yes. That's where my daughter went to school, by the way. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Larry Page from Google, a few others. Oh, okay. Um, he actually gave our commencement speech. Um, so I was in the business school there. Okay. And so I, I, I um, studied mostly finance and corporate strategy. So when I graduated, I started my career in investment banking in New York. Oh, okay. Yes. That was awesome and exhausting. <laughs> so that'll teach you. So, so dad was an investment banker, stockbroker growing yes, up, and, and now he's all things fitness. Um, and seeing him transition out of that. And I don't know if you happen to listen to the Dear White Women podcast. No. Sarah and Sasha, they hail from, they were Harvard Business and went through the whole financial district. And So anyways, it's, it's a total jungle, but I think learnings are pretty amazing. Yeah, you know, um, I everything I learned on that job I continue to use today. Okay, you know, our, our financial models, how to project, you know, future revenue and, and produce evaluation from that, kind of nerdy stuff. But it's awesome, you know. You, you kind of need to know your stuff when you're going out to raise money from from serious institutional investors. Absolutely. Um, so I feel really confident doing that um, because of that background. Um, that being said, I was very happy to get out of banking. Yeah. It was <laughs> exasperating. Okay. Yeah. Solid word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're in the office till two in the morning. Yeah. Every night, every weekend. Um, you know, the things that your bosses think are life or death uh, or death just aren't. Yeah. You know, like, and it's like, well, you're not going to see your kids because of this. Like, yeah. no, get out of here. Yeah. Go, go to your kids' soccer games. They hate you. Yeah. <laughs> you're not around enough. <laughs> I promise you. Yeah. Just because they're not money when you go away is not going to make up for things. Really, really. And yeah. if you stay in banking long enough, you just get, you get stuck. You know, your kids are in private school and they want to stay in private school. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not to be stereotypical, but your wife is used to shopping at Louis Vuitton now, not yeah. Macy's. And yeah. you just kind of pigeonhole yourself in this lifestyle that's genuinely making you miserable. Golden handcuffs, man. Precisely. Yeah. Um, so I got out after about a year and a half, two years, um, and I, I never looked back. <laughs> did you, did you kind of, we talked about this some, some other casts, and just in life, because I do have a lot of humans that have switched from corporate world to entrepreneurship. And I think there's, you know, uh, positives and negatives on all sides, of course. Um, but did you see yourself being in that culture in the daily exposure? Did it kind of wear you down? Did you see like a shift in your own personality? Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. I became a, a bitter person, you know, just kind of angry. You're so tired. Yeah. You're just so tired. Yeah. And you're, you know, you're up on the 40th floor of this skyscraper and you're looking down it's 5 PM and you're seeing everyone walking to the subways, walking to go home. And your day is literally only halfway over. Oh, you're going to be in the office for many more hours. That's insane. It just breeds some resentment. 
Um, and so, you know, the thing that I loved most about banking was, was frankly, my fellow analyst class. Yeah. We were all just so united yeah. in our exhaustion yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, the time we were putting in there. So, we, you know, we had fun, but um, a lot of miserable people in yeah. investment banking. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's always just such a good example of um, like fitness or business or whatever, like the five people around you or 15 or whatever, the culture, like your immediate environment, even if you're strong willed and like, you know who you are and you're grounded, it'll break you down no matter what. And you will become that no mm -hmm. matter what. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a fascinating, like psychological, um, not even experiment, just like a situation to like continuously watch whatever, whatever environment is watching people just naturally assimilate because it, it wears you down. Yeah. So um, good for you or any of my humans that are in any situation like that, they can have that self-awareness and pull out because I think getting out of it is equally as detoxifying. Like that's hard. It's, it's tough. Um, I was actually a little surprised by the response that I got when I announced that I was quitting. You know, I was expecting people to say, oh, she couldn't hack it, she couldn't cut it. But my, my peers, they came up to me and said, I'm so jealous of you. Oh, really? I'm okay. so jealous you're getting out. And okay. it's like, you're not chained to your desk. Yeah. You can do it too. Yeah. Just, just do it. You know, if you're not unhappy. And it's remarkable how few people do it until it, it gets kind of pretty far down the road. Yeah. Um, and at that point, you know, I, I gained probably 20 pounds in six months. Well, I mean, if you're, job. you're stressed out. I'm assuming you're eating whatever's quick or not eating, not sleeping. There's zero self-care, I assume. Zero self-care. Um, you know, you get a, a dinner budget because they know you're going to be in there past dinner. So oh, you're able okay. to order in as much food as you want. You know, I had a 24-hour fitness uh, gym membership and I was going at two in the morning, literally on the wow. elliptical. You can only sustain that for so right, long, right. you know, so ultimately that stopped. So when um, were you really sleeping, like 3 a.m. to 6 or something yeah, crazy? Yeah, oh 3 to 7, yep, oh about my 4 God. hours a night. Yeah. That is insane. And how, what's the average age of the, this human that's doing this? Well, your analyst class, it's like a three-year analyst program. It's, it's right after college. Okay. And people are just vying for these spots at these yeah. big banks. Um, and they, you know, I, I'll never knock it. I love having it on my resume. Sure. sure. I really do. Um, I'm so glad I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's like anything. Like I always say people, everybody should be a waitress or in service or something. Yeah. Um, whatever is like privy to whatever you're getting into next, because it is, I mean, those learnings and that humbling space that like, I just think it keeps you so grounded no matter what, because you can always go back and remember and be like, Oh, like I remember how hard it was. And I'm so thankful to be in this like aligned flow right now. Right. Um, that those are such key pieces. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing. And at least it only took you like a year. Like, and I think it's such a slippery slope that you do, you get you caught into these golden handcuff situations and you have bills and kids and spouse and everything else. Yeah. So it sounds like you like got out right at the right time. Right, exactly. Yeah, okay. So we got out of that. What, what was next move once you're like, I quit, I'm out. And this is kind of indicative of our whole conversation of taking the leap, which is so hard. So we took the leap there, what was next move? Yeah, so the, the next move for me was um, going back to um, University of Michigan for a football game, which I hadn't done in two years since you know I was working every weekend. Yeah. So I uh, I just I bought a plane ticket really spontaneously on a Friday to make it out to a Saturday morning game. Um, I flew into to Detroit. It's about two in the morning, and of course I had done it all so spontaneously that I hadn't really planned where I was going to stay. I just said, you know, screw it. Yes. I'll figure it out when I'm there. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll call, I'll call all the hotels. They were all booked up, you know, for a year because these games just, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. They, they okay. up. And so I'm, I'm looking on my phone at the map and I see this one hotel in the center of downtown, right near the stadium, um, that I'd never heard of before. So I called it, um, and they sure enough said, yeah, yeah, you come on in. Um, and I was so relieved. I couldn't, couldn't believe it. Um, ah. right as I was hanging up the phone, the guy stops me and says, whoa, wait, wait, do you want a nightly rate or an hourly rate? Oh my, <laughs> you're like wrong kind of entrepreneur. Like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of place is this? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> it's a nightly. Uh, and I, I rolled up and, and sure enough, I mean, it's, it's an actual flop house. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what is, what full definition of flop house? Well, there were, just so I'm not stereotyping in my mind, but I kind of think I have a grasp. You know, um, people of the night, ladies of the oh, night kind okay. of hanging out outside and oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same working hours as you. Yeah. <laughs> But maybe a little more sleep. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Maybe a little more sleep. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, no judgment. You know, yeah. I was like, all right, well, I got to sleep. I don't have any other option here. 
So, you know, you go in, there's just cigarette burns in the pillowcases. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, no bathroom in the room. It was a shared bathroom down the hall. Oh, okay. You know, so I, I went to bed and was like, just, just go to sleep. Just try yeah. to sleep. Um, but I wake up and it's a beautiful Saturday morning, you know, in the fall. Um, and this hotel, as I said, it's like one block from Main Street, which was voted one of the top 10 Main Streets in America, okay. uh, and two blocks away from Google's new office, which is like 2,000 employee office. And so I realized to myself, like, okay, this cannot be one of only three downtown hotel options for, yeah. for people coming to Ann Arbor. That's just un un unbelievable. Yeah. Um, you know, everything else is by the interstate. It's kind of like Howard Johnson, you know, nothing really, yeah. um, nothing special. And so I thought, I'm gonna buy this hotel and I'm gonna turn it into something that people actually wanna stay in. Okay, okay. And so that actually went, it went really well. Oh, so you actually, time. let's talk about that process a little bit. That's insane. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the city was desperate for it. The university yeah. was desperate for it. They were embarrassed by this too. Um, and so the, the city was willing to change zoning laws for us to get this done. No way. Um, the whole town wanted it, the tourism bureau wanted it. Um, so we did a lot of um, uh, community outreach, really establishing that there is very real local demand here for this. Okay. Um, but it was right after the financial crisis. So and like 2008-ish? Yeah, right. It was like 2009, 2010. Okay. Um, and Michigan, especially, was still reeling. And um, Detroit, Detroit in particular. And they're still kind of on the upswing, which um, miraculous things have happened since. I, I, I have heard. I, yeah. When I was there... <laughs> Not, not so much the case. The last grocery store in all of Detroit moved out no the year way. I graduated. Oh my God. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. And it was because of the motor industry and everything else. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, we had the whole town on board with building this hotel. It was going to be a hotel and a community space. So a place where, where locals could hang out too. Okay. Um, but it was in this kind of um, post-crisis uh, age where uh, none of the banks I was going to say, how'd you get funding? And I'm assuming even because you kind of had homies in the game with your background. Right, um, right. And like strategic partnerships, but even still, you got to put stuff on paper and make it make sense. Exactly. And so we went out to the banks, the traditional banks, um, with this plan. We had all of the backing one would need. But they said, look, we understand Ann Arbor is a very different town from the rest of Michigan. It's been much more insulated from, from the downturn. However, it is in our mandates that we cannot lend for real estate development purposes in the state of Michigan. So you're out of luck. Wait, why is that? Why is it in the mandates? It was just they, they could not lend for real estate development purposes. There was such a surplus of, of real it. estate on the market already and valuations had just plummeted that okay. there was no new development that they were willing to fund in the entire state. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So that was uh, when I kind of had a light bulb moment. It was, all right, well, there is such real and present demand for this in this town by, by locals that if we can't rely on traditional funding mechanisms, let's tap this local demand. Let's tap the financial capacity Innovation. of this town. I love it. Oh my God, this is like, and now we're gonna talk about coronavirus. Like this is, wow, this is all serendipitously happening so. Yeah, just yeah. Okay. Um, so that was, that was the idea for my first company that I founded. It was called Ground Up. It was letting uh, locals invest in development that they wanted to see in their own backyards. No. How long did it take from point of bank saying no to, to Ground Up being a bank? Uh, two months. Oh, dude, that's quick. Well, it was like, look, we want to get this built. And yeah. we've got thousands of people saying they want it. And Ann Arbor's kind of a well-off town. And there's, you know, yeah. there's, there's private investors there. And, um, okay. you know, it was just like, look, you know, traditional banks don't need to be the reason a, a town doesn't develop. Completely agree. And, well, and just, I mean, you see some big companies now where it's employee-owned or what have you, which I yeah. think is the way of the future. Because then you're invested in it. It's just, I mean, like being a business owner, you know, if your employees are invested and it's a piece of their world, the, the way they even look at the entire situation, the psychology around it completely shifts. So it's, it's amazing. Did you do, um, like, what was that process like? I mean, I'm sure it's more complicated than, you know, a five minute answer, but what, I mean, was it like a GoFundMe super grassroots or people just showing up? Uh, well, it was, it was family and friends uh, around, <clears throat> excuse me, funded. Um, we, we, um, I, I was still living in New York at the time, so we launched out of New York, you know, had okay. an early team around us, um, and, uh, because we were launching in New York, it was actually easiest for us, uh, to start, um, with a project that was being developed in New York, that this really innovative architectural firm wanted to, to get off the ground, um, and they wanted okay. to do it in a very crowdfunded kind of way, 
it was it was really cool. It was called Plus Pool. Okay. It was plus plus sign shaped pool that sat on the East River off of Brooklyn, and it was like a giant Brita filter. So you were swimming in filtered river water. What? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And we were we were the regular crowdfunding partner for that, so they were able to raise money to get that project off the ground through. So that was like proof of concept. Exactly. Yes. That's a, so how did you, how, first of all, how are you managing this with full-time job? It's like all the time plus this side situation. Oh, I had quit. Banking oh, you had at that quit. Point. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, this, so you kept space in New York. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yes. It's like, oh my God, for three. So you're like literally not sleeping. Right. Um, no, okay. I didn't sleep. <laughs> so yeah. So I mean, even three hours is not like you're a zombie a, a few months in. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So you have plus pool. Is this, is this still in existence? I'm assuming. It is. Yeah, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that establishes how long from that project to, uh, Ann Arbor was, when did that come to fruition? Well, that was um, a two-year process, and before we could really get um, things developed in Ann Arbor, we had uh, kind of an issue with the, the foundational team, the founding team. There okay. was just some, you know, with one of my co-founders, uh, we were just misaligned on, on what we wanted to achieve. Okay. So he had a real estate development background. He, you know, he wanted to develop property, but really no more than that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to change how cities were developed from here on out okay. based on who could finance them. So different heart spaces. Totally. Absolutely. Okay. So we split very amicably. Um, my other co-founder uh, lied about his visa status oh, and okay. was getting deported back to Ireland. So the whole thing came toppling down. How did you find the, cause going into business with people is really, really hard. How did you find this team or these humans? Yeah. I, I pitched it at a startup event. Um, oh. Where you're meant to find people who, who like what you're, you're, you're you've conceived of and are willing to join you in, in um, getting it off the ground. So I, I came away from that event with two co-founders um, who wow. are great guys, you know, really great guys. Um, but I think devil's in the details. Well, <sighs> entrepreneurs can sometimes be so desperate for help because it's, it's too much to do alone. Right. That when two people, two you know, good upstanding people come to you and say, I love your mission, I wanna help you build this, you know, it's almost impossible to, to yeah. turn that down. I mean, unless they're, they're, they're truly heinous. Yeah. You know, you're just happy for the support. Totally. Well, I'm, in metaphor in life, you always need support for things. And I think that's anything that any of my strong type A humans, like you learn on the road, it's like, I'm gonna do this one, I'm gonna figure it out. And this is a lesson I've learned many times. And it's like, no, no. Build your team, but also let people do things. Like you have to outsource and you know task people to other things, and just trusting is really hard. Um, but like you just said, there's a, the other side of it is knowing how valuable your dream, your vision, your goal is, and protecting it with everything, even when it when it's nothing. When you're at zero, there's no value in it. There's no brand equity. There's nothing. Like to really learn the hard way, and I've done this many times as well. To to just really take pull back and like know how valuable it is, and not let everybody in. And you don't learn that until you do it. And you're like, oh, it wasn't the right person. And learning how to screen and filter the right client, the right team, whatever is, I mean, such an invaluable lesson in itself. So, yeah. no, I mean, no judgment whatsoever. More on the side of, thank God that happened because you do learn so much from it. So much. You know, um, I knew the next time around that identifying the right fits for the team was going to yeah. be paramount, mm -hmm. even if it took longer. Mm -hmm. um, but that that lesson came... It was a hard lesson to learn. Sure. I mean, that that was really like the first big failure I'd ever really experienced in my life. Like I always performed, you know, quite well in school. Yeah. Um, and so it laid me out. Yeah. I mean, like in my parents' house for a year, just on the couch, okay. just trying to recover. Oh, okay. But I mean, this is, I hate saying failure, but this is such a big learn. I and mean, this is like pivot point in your, you're still, I mean, what were you like 28 then? I was 26. Six. Okay, I mean that's young human. Yeah, I mean, these are even like big business decisions if you're 40, let alone 26 year old. Like you haven't lived that much life. Even if you went to great school and you know worked with all the great humans, there's just minimal experience of it. And so these are pretty big gangster moves, you know, under 30. Yeah, it was a lot to take on. And so when it when it crumbled, when it collapsed, yeah. um, I collapsed with it. Sure, sure. Well, you, I, I mean, you're somebody I can see that you, you bleed what you do. And when my humans, because like, I mean, I identify with that. It's so hard to just do 100%, not 110%, and not just fully embrace what it is. And that balance, again, also learning, is something that's noteworthy. Where it's You can believe your brand and your project, and you need to have your life and your balance and everything else that goes alongside it. Um, so it's, 
I don't know, but these are all good lessons. Okay, so we've got hotel it, or uh, team building and redoing hotel. Um, ground up, is that what it was called? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so ground up. What what happened with hotel? Team disbanded or did it ever get off the ground? It or? disbanded. Okay. It disbanded. So yeah. what happened? To, is the hotel the same as it is to this day? To my knowledge. Okay. Yeah. Are there future plans at some point to retackle that? No, no. You know, um, it was it was right for that time. Um, and now what I'm doing with, with, with Flex is just, it's it's my absolute passion now. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I went through that period. Yeah. But as I said, um, you know, when I when I was laid out by it um, and just really picking up the pieces and recovering, um, you know, the gym was a really, it was a really um, safe space and, and powerful way for me to get back to, to feeling like myself and regain my strength. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, I've, I've been a lifelong athlete, but the gym, the gym has really been there for me in times of like turmoil yeah. or when you really need to find your own inner strength as well as, you know, outer strength, of course. Um, so like that, that really helped me get back off, uh, up onto my feet. Um, and then I stayed in New York, um, for a few more years, I was working at other tech companies, um, that, that weren't my own, which was great. You know, okay. you, you don't want to go right back into starting your own thing again. You, you know, you need some time totally. to, to learn if nothing else, um, from other people. So I did that. Um, but you know, I was, I was kind of done with New York at that point. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I've always, I absolutely like if you look at my social media, I, there's just something about New York that I love. And even out here, people will be like, you talk so fast, where are you from? I'm like, actually, I'm from here. Um, but they're like, well, you just have like this East Coast vibe. I'm like, I don't know, so it's somewhere in my soul. And I've never, I've spent time out there, but I've never lived. And I think that's another thing that every human should do is live in Manhattan, even for a month. And just like catch up with the pace, drink in like the humans, the culture, the food, the, everything. Yeah. Um, but I can see how it eats you up and kind of spits you out, but you walk away with like necessary like battle scars that are like honorary. New York's great. Everybody yeah. should go to New York. Yes. Um, it's a super fun town. Um, but you know, <laughs> it's a lot. It, it's a lot. Everyone's so, everyone's so overworked, overstressed. They don't even, they wear it like a badge of honor. Yeah. When yeah. Really, it's like, guys, I know you want <laughs> more to your life than this. Stop yeah. fooling yourselves, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Okay. Yeah. I understand. Um, and so, yeah, you know, like the only thing to do there often is just like party and go to brunch. Yeah. And I wanted more outdoors. <laughs> Basic white girls here. What do we do with brunch? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's the best parties and the best brunch. Yeah. But I wanted more. I, I wanted the outdoors. I wanted to be around nature. And so I was just sitting in my office on like a Tuesday morning. And I'd been to Colorado once when I was 15 on a family trip. And I just, I really liked it. And I thought, all right, well, now or never. And I just booked a one-way flight. Oh, you and these one ways right? <laughs> for these spontaneous tickets, I should say. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's that's amazing. so you just you went to Denver once. Wait, where was your family from? Uh, Connecticut. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you, primarily East Coast, even yep. I mean, Michigan, still east of here. Um, okay, so you came here one time and then you just booked a ticket. Did you come straight to Denver? Yeah, I came straight to Denver. I wasn't sure whether I wanted Denver or Boulder. Um, I'd never seen Boulder. Okay. And when I visited, I just fell in love. Yeah. So that's where I knew I wanted to live. I um, you know, found, a, found a job at a software company um, in, in Boulder. And that's hard. When was this? This was in 2016. Oh, okay. Because, I mean, everybody wants to come to Denver or Boulder. Mm -hmm. So finding opportunity is pretty, it's tough. If you can find a job, like, you jump on it. You know, uh, it was it was the fastest I'd ever found oh. a job in my whole life. Okay. But I... Uh, I know it's because and this is, I don't know how some listeners are going to, <laughs> is it worth this information? Woo? It's woo! No, exactly I'm here for all of it, yeah. It so is. I mean, I woke up every day and meditated for about 30 minutes, set this intention of getting this you job. You manifested it. I absolutely manifested yes, it. Yes, okay. The first time in my life I'd ever really tried that, you okay. know? Um, my sister, she's, she's so much more advanced than I am with this stuff, and she had really taught these kind of uh, exercises to me, and so I just, I actively... Uh, forcefully um, manifested you know, oh. this this outcome. Okay. Um, and so yeah, I got that job, and it was it was it was everything I needed to set up in a new new town. It you know kept you know took care of me, and you know it was a comfortable salary, and I didn't want to start a new company while moving to a new yeah. town at the same time. Like that's never gonna work. Right. Um. So yeah, it was it was everything I needed at the time, and was just miserable is the wrong word it was just boring enough 
for yeah. me to know. When you're coming from New York and Boulder, <laughs> regardless of what side you, you like or dislike or what fits or doesn't, that, I mean, you are on pe- different sides of the universe between New York and Boulder. Right. right. Totally right. different energies. Right. And it, so it was a great job, but um, it, I, I knew this is finite. And once I get, you know, a stable foundation under me, like, you know, I've been here for a year or so, then I'll, I'm going to restart my okay. next company. Yeah. Okay. And you told me, we, we spoke briefly, um, you were on, it was this corporate job where you're like, I'm traveling, I'm not getting, you know, my gym time. And that's where this, where we're at right now has kind of come to. Fruition. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Um, so as I said, moved to a new town, 2000 miles away from home. I didn't know anybody, new job. Um, the gym was the place that made me feel really grounded. What gym did you land at? I belonged to the Colorado Athletic Club. Oh yeah. Yeah. CAC. In Boulder, yeah, CAC. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Loved it. Yes. I love the CAC. And so that place um, was very sacred to me. Mm-hmm. You know, it felt, um, I felt um, accepted. I felt part of the community. It was like a really just warm, inviting place. While well, at the same time, it, you know, it energized you and yeah. it made you feel more powerful. Um, and it was just kind of the perfect, the perfect space that I needed to feel at home in a new place and strong enough to take on, you know, this new challenge. Um, and so it was just um, a really important place to me. That's well, I always say fitness is such a phenomenal filter. I mean, that's CrossFit kind of provided in lacrosse from college. Um, the, the humans in my life because it just filters out people like-minded humans to come in, whether they're in different career sets or family people or not, like there's just this common denominator of showing up to better yourself. And so it's just this filter that can foster a community that's such a great base layer for whatever your next step is. Right. And before I had a community of my own in Boulder, I was part of that community. Yeah. So did you do like high intensity training classes? Yeah. Or like, okay. Absolutely. Okay. My favorite trainer, Tristan Lowell, shout out. Hey. <laughs> He's awesome. He, he ran my favorite TRX and hit classes. And okay. Yeah, it was just an awesome, awesome space for me. Um, I just loved being a member there. Um, but as you said, I was traveling quite a lot for my job. So four days out of the month, I'm in another city with our other offices. And for me to maintain that routine, my gym routine, you know, you're spending $25, $30 on a day pass. Yeah. You know, which after four days... That's more than the entire <laughs> month membership. Month. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and more than the entire membership back home, which of yeah. course you're not using because you're out of town. So that kind of compounds the pain that you're feeling. Right. And so it was in this hotel room in Minnetonka, Minnesota, that I, I kind of had this this frustration come to a, a, a point where it was, you know, I'm not going to pay thirty dollars for a day pass every time. And so now I'm in this hotel room. I ate takeout because I can't cook. Right. Um. You know, I. I return home from these these day, uh, these these um, business trips four pounds heavier every time like this is ridiculous Put water and salt and not training not sleep I mean all of it yeah right exactly um, and so in that hotel room I thought like there's got to be there's got to be a better way you know um, what would get this gym to accept ten dollars from me not thirty dollars mm-hmm. and not screw over the gym because that wouldn't be sustainable um, and so I, I thought to myself okay well you know I know that the gym is, is, you know, it's seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night. I know it's mostly empty right now. I know most of their members aren't using their memberships right now. Yeah. And I know half of their members are going to quit this year because of that. That's the national average. So had you done a little research before? Like, did you have this idea and then you started digging into research? It, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I knew, I knew a significant portion of members quit every year because they just don't use it enough. They don't want right. to keep paying for it. Um, and then when I did the research, yeah, it's 50%. Some stats are 45%, but national average gyms churn half of their members. I didn't know. I knew it was high because I've been kind of in fitness and been on the business side and I knew it was high turnover, but that's unreal. I mean, it must, it's incredibly frustrating. You must imagine like you're a mouse on a wheel. Absolutely. You, you know, you work hard, spend, spend tons of money on sales and marketing just to end up right back where you were every December. Yeah. And the conversation on sales and marketing is a whole other one because... I mean, it's not even, it's not working. It's just, that's the nature of this beast. Exactly. And so, okay. Exactly. So, so this idea is burned. Yeah. And, and the number one reason a person quits the gym is cost. I don't oh, want to keep paying okay. for this. I'm just, I'm just not using it enough. Right. So I thought to myself in that hotel room, okay, well, what if we make these members stakeholders in this day pass transaction? You know, they're not using their membership right now. Why don't I buy that day off of them? You know, the gym gets a good cut of that sale. 
Um, so they're making money, but the gym has also done something really significant to retain that member month over month because right. they're able to give more value back to that member when they weren't using their membership. So it seems, you know, like you know the the, the the guilt or frustration over having a membership that you're not using goes away. Right. And if, if you're able to subsidize the cost on top of that, you know, huge. 30, 40 bucks back every month. Yeah. Huge. So the solution came about because it needed to work for gyms just as much as it needed to work for me. How did you think of that though? How were you like, take membership and then how do I, you know, I can subsidize, like where did that thought press come from? Very much inspired by Airbnb, Lyft, Turo, okay. you know, the, the sharing economy pioneers who saw these underutilized assets could be monetized. Yeah. You know, and a gym membership is a very real asset. It's a virtual asset, mm -hmm. but they are chronically underused, just like a car or an empty bedroom. Yeah. Um, so why don't we return more value to the, the owners of these assets when they're not being used? Yeah. And I love just to sprinkle, I love the, the juxtaposition. I mean, obviously we're on turmeric and tequila, but we have super educated finance human, and then we insert some woo. Um, just like the, like, I mean, it's literally turmeric and tequila. Yeah. Um, and then also with the share, I always say like, I have so much faith in our young humans because they share cars, they share Airbnb, like everything is like building community, which obviously our world needs more than ever. Just wash your hands right now. Um, but it builds these communities. So on one side, it's profitable business idea. And on the other, it, it, I mean, you are fostering this larger community, which helps keep you into fitness, keep you into these things. And fitness, obviously, like the mental health and wellness outside of looking good in a bikini, the endorphins and the chemical. I mean, these are just two things that the world needs on so many levels right now. So I'm super pumped not only to hear it's a thing and it's, it could be a potentially a very profitable one, but just on larger woo, um, you know, it's bringing our world together. And it's one more situation where we can share and connect and, you know, foster a mutually beneficial relationship between humans. Absolutely. And that's what our world needs on so many levels. Um, so anyways, there's my woo-woo rant. But... Um, okay, so we've got <clears throat> idea, we've done research. What is next step into getting flex shares being a thing? Uh, yes, so you know, I really did want to validate that this was, um, you know, had legs. And so sure. I did the market research, confirmed these stats, um, you know, did, uh, interviewed so many gym um, owners, personal trainers, you know, gym employees around town, and interviewed people. Is this something that you would use? Um, and it was a resounding yes. Um, so okay. I left that, that software job um, and, and endeavored to, to build Flex. Um, the name was, came to me fairly immediately, double entendre, I suppose. Hey. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> seriously. Um, and so I knew I needed engineers to build a proof of concept. Um, I didn't really have the money to pay you know, a $120,000 salary for an engineer. Um, so when I was to, doing this initial research, um, I was doing it out of the cafe in Galvanize. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is the co-working uh, space. Is there one in Boulder or this one down here? There's one in Boulder. Okay. Yep, okay. yep. Um, co-working space and coding academy. And so oh, okay. I actually took an intro to JavaScript course. It was just a, a, an entire Saturday of intro to JavaScript. Oh, I should probably do this. Okay. Well, was, I knew I wasn't going to code, but right, I knew right. that I was going to have developers who I would want to know how to speak to yes. knowledgeably. And you already learned the team thing, like we need to exactly. exactly. figure out the right humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, if I don't even understand their basic lexicon, you know, that doesn't put me in a great position of authority. Right, <laughs> right, absolutely. And especially, I hate to say it, being a female, right. being right. younger, like you have to come to the table equipped in all capacities. Totally. And that's a real conversation. So good for you, okay. Yeah, and so um, one of the uh, TAs in that course heard what I was um, kind of working on. They said, you know, our students, they have capstone projects, um, which they usually develop their own thing, but if we hear of someone in the community doing something really cool, we sometimes let you come in and pitch to the class, and you might come away with you know one or two st uh, students to, to help you build the thing. Wow, okay. I mean, you know, we're, so were you manifesting this entire time? Uh, I had slowed down. <laughs> okay, you like <laughs> universe, I mean, things do come in due time, but I didn't know if that was still part of like the strategic plan-ish. Oh, meditation is, 100% uh, one of my tools okay. as CEO, 100%. Okay. So yeah, I, I was definitely still man um, uh, meditating at that time. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, not as much concerted effort as, as previously. Um, but so I, I came in and pitched the students and came up with four engineers. Wow. Yeah, to build the, the really early stage of the software. Um, it was enough to raise some money and hire the two best ones to be our first 
uh, engineers on the team. So so they come on board. That's amazing. And I'm assuming they did it for free or college credit. Yeah. And then what, what was the legal rights? Like, did they own part of it then? No. Or what's, it's a, like a waiver prior or some documentation saying you create it and then you still own it? So they were able to retain ownership of that uh, like initial piece of software that they built. Got it. Okay. We were able to raise money. And, you know, because that was kind of a short-term class project, right. um, we really didn't retain any of that code. Oh, okay. Um, so we, um, you know, we brought on a, an, a CTO, an interim CTO, who had like 20 years of, of um, experience managing engineering teams. Um, and so he really helped lay down the architecture for our, um, for our really beta um, um, software. Okay. Um, that so that's what got those. funding for yes. the real situation. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then, and this was, the, so 2014, you said you came to Boulder. 2016. 16, sorry. Yes. And then when was this? When did this process? This was the winter of 2018. Okay. So a couple years working, yes. dreams, research, uh, academy, for, for engineers volunteering, and now we have proof of concept. Right. We're funding in 2018. Um, what was next step from there? Well, the next step was getting the um, getting the gyms on board. Okay. Um, so you know the hypothesis um, seemed really really logical. You know that I just explained the, the membership sharing concept. Sure. Um, and our engineers were at work. You know building it out. The, you know the mechanics of it all. Um, but it was it was up to me to go out to gyms and and sell the thing. Yeah. You know make sure they understood this um, and and that they would want this. And um, I was very grateful that my very first conversation, my very first sale, I've never been a salesperson before. Great. So my very first time walking to a gym and pitching Flex uh, was a success. Okay. Yeah. We, okay. Um, it was uh, One Boulder Fitness. Oh, did you, no, I just had to know, just coming from New York, what did you wear going into a gym? Because <laughs> Boulder is its own animal. Oh my gosh. And like to show up in like a suit. Or something like that is so, it's a lot. Oh, it's a lot. And yeah. I, I haven't taken out my heels <laughs> oh, okay. since New York in, yeah. in Boulder. Like, I don't know, like I count on one hand. Okay. So you've been there long enough to see what the culture is and kind of show up as part of the crew. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Super casual. I yeah. can't even remember what I was wearing. You know, okay. it wasn't slovenly, but yeah, yeah, it's very, <laughs> very casual. Which is great. Like, if you see what I'm wearing now, like, I get to roll out of bed and still be on brand. Yeah, no, 100% and well said. That's, like, that's how it's, and if you show up, because I've done a lot, um, sales but unintentionally so, and if you can't assimilate with the crowd, mm -hmm. that right there is, like, the first, like, stop sign into the next conversation of your sales. So, mm -hmm. I'm always curious, I'm like, because gyms are their own humans, and it's their own community. So when you're going into it, you really do have to come from it and know what it is, which I knew you did your research and whatnot, but I was just curious coming from formal New York, you know, financial situation now into Boulder, yeah. um, how that transition was. Oh, I was so ready to shed that aesthetic. Okay. It came okay. very easy to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like your authentic you is more this than NYC, but yeah. either way. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So I, I met with the GM there, uh, <coughs> Kyle, and, and forgive the uh, pronunciation of his last name. I'm not really sure. Fit Yay, I think. Okay. Um, but I was so glad that he was the first one that I pitched Flex to yeah. out in the field. Um, you know, he, he got it instantly. He said, well, this is such a great idea. Why didn't I come up with this yeah. idea? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, it was great to have his buy-in and, and have them be the, you know, the first beta partner we had. And, went across the street or a few blocks up to CrossFit Sanitas. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah. and Tom at CrossFit Sanitas, he, he got it as well, and he signed on as, as our next partner. And then Amana Yoga, John Sieben, um, he signed on as our first partner, and it was just three for three. And, oh, my gosh. Okay. And I was feeling really good. Um, and then we went to the spot climbing gym, and they said no. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so... I, I was really intent on understanding that no. Yeah. And so, you know, really met with their marketing manager, Scott. Um, and, you know, it was a no up front. And then after about half an hour, it turned into, okay, let's see. Okay. All right. I'm Did not, they just not understand or you know, what was they the just, I think a lot of gyms these days are um, skeptical of tech. Mm -hmm. They've been really burned. Mm -hmm. um, by some um, 
um, some tech companies out there that really have promised them the world and then really underdelivered or in some cases um, cannibalized their business or really hurt them. Sure. Um, so there's some real skepticism. I mean, gyms have been around for, for a very long time and they've done things their way for a very long time and it's and it's often worked. Yeah. Um, so I think there's this sense of well, who are these tech companies coming in now that think that they deserve a cut of this community that I've worked so hard yeah, to Yeah, they protect their, it's not even just the business, it's their, their people. These are the people you see every day you build, build relationships, you know, there's vulnerability there. I mean, all these things. So, I mean, good for them for being so protective. Totally. And um, that's the exact word that I would use. It was okay. very protective of his community, which yeah. I completely understand Absolutely. and respect. So the fact that he was willing to give us a chance when this was something that, you know, he, he could conceivably just go on doing it the way he's been doing it for years and, and no change, you know, whatsoever. So the fact that he was willing to give us a chance um, was really, it was really special. Yeah. Well, I think that says, says a lot about you because I do think particularly our, you know, our fitness human is a different, and fitness business owner, it's just a different breed of human. Um, and so and I think they're really good at getting to know and being able to trust people. And so again, if you walk in with a suit and you already like, it doesn't seem like you're a community fit, there's there's a wall and justifiably so. Right. So I think it says a lot to you and your character and that they must've been able to see, not only they trust you, but they see this stems from heart space. They see that it's not just coming in and like monetizing the crowd and the relationships they've worked to build. Um, and I also think when new businesses start out, your sales team, your front runners, are it's so critical to have that correct human because they're your voice, they're your brand, they're the one introducing you to the community. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't stem from authentic space, especially in 2020, you know, our humans see through that, particularly our young people and particularly our fitness crowd. Um, so the compliments to you, I think if it, if it worked and he could see through that, that's huge. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Um, so we just kind of carried on like that um, until we had 40 gyms and, and studios across Boulder and Denver um, okay. kind of signed on, um, on the uh, available in the Flex Marketplace. Um, and it was really just um, working through the tech at that point. Um, you know, it was a it was a very um, it was an adequate piece of software, mm -hmm. but it, it still had a lot of bugs. You know, it it, it, it kind of served its most basic functionality, but it really needed to be you know far more robust. But that's okay. This was a learning period, and we sure. didn't have the money to do that. Sure. What well, I think you got to do that research and let it just run because you don't know you don't know, and there's only so much you can research. You got to just see it run. Totally. Totally. Um, so we learned what gyms need to see more of. We learned how, how users are interacting with this product. And I think one of the, um, the coolest things that we noticed with the platform was, was who was using this. Yeah. So when you went on to Flex in, in the early days and you belonged to one of those gyms that we were partnered with, um, you could just go in and list whatever days that you weren't going to use. You know, you know you're going out of town next week. Oh, okay. Um, list those for sale, and then someone who wanted to buy, you know, a day at that gym and, and pay less than you know twenty five dollar, you know, typical price, um, would go on and, and buy that day from you, and you'd make five bucks, and everyone everyone's happy. Um, what we noticed um, was was really cool. It was that. Um, uh, in some weeks, um, up to 100%, but usually 33% of all the sales, all the day pass purchases on our site mm -hmm. were being bought by members of these gyms. So they yeah. belonged somewhere, but they, while they were there listing oh. days, they said, oh, I, I, but I'd love to go to yoga on Friday yes. instead. Yeah. I'm gonna buy that. So you had this tremendous overlap of supply and demand. Okay. That makes complete sense. Yes. It does, and what's shocking is I, I later validated through, through just industry reports and research that that's the exact behavior of the modern gym consumer. Mm -hmm. That one third of gym members either have multiple memberships or patronize multiple facilities to get that kind of well-rounded fitness routine. Right. And we were seeing that mirrored on our website. Okay. Um, and why that's so cool, kind of from tech terms, uh, from technology standpoint or business standpoint, is when you have that overlap of supply and demand, yeah. that creates instant marketplace liquidity. So you don't have to introduce all new, brand new demand into the system when you have a third of your supply side users, also your demand side users. Okay. Um, so we just, we saw that our most active users of Flex were these people who liked to do, to go to multiple facilities to work out. I want to, I think that's kind of like business rule, like 80% of your business comes from 20% of your clientele. Right, right. So like all this, the old school cliches kind of come in. Um, but that makes so much sense just from personal standpoint. I, you know, CrossFit membership, and then if I want to do yoga, it's like another hundred bucks. Right. And spin class is another hundred. So you just, 
either drop in once in a while or you uh you know come in for the free trial and you never come back and whatever but you do want to diversify what you're doing and again humanity standpoint it's so good to get into these other communities and make other friends outside of your immediate community so okay interesting and i i I guess I wouldn't have thought of that right away. I would, would have needed to see it, but that makes complete sense. Yeah, okay. yeah. So what was next up from there? How did you guys pivot knowing that intel? Sure. Um, well, actually, that's a really great question. We didn't pivot knowing that intel. We just, we, we really enjoyed um, watching it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, fair enough. Um, but we, it was going to guide our future marketing efforts gotcha. to target these, these um, most valuable um, users. At the time, we had no money. Yeah. Like, no money, no market. We spent literally zero dollars on marketing. Oh, okay. So it was all word of mouth? It was all word of mouth. It was all word of mouth. That's unreal, too. Yeah, you know, the gyms, like CrossFit, <coughs> Sunias, and One Boulder Fitness, they were good about getting the word out about us. Sure. Um, you know, One Boulder Fitness, they had um, flyers in their, their bathroom stalls, and um, they actually had our flyer on a cork board in their gym. Okay. And so when they would do a tour of the facilities to prospective members, their last stop on the tour was this bulletin board. And they oh. would point to our flyer and said, also, we want to tell you about our partnership with Flex, where if you join One Boulder Fitness, yeah. you can sell days you're not using and make some money back. And, and they told us how people's eyes just lit That's up. That's a huge value add for them. They sold more memberships as a yeah. result of it. Yeah. Do, so is, edu is um, like affiliate edu or gym education a part of the sales process now? It's part of the onboarding process. Um, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, it's very much a sales tool for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and they, they also said that they were able to retain more members that summer who otherwise would have quit because they don't use it as much over the summer. But because they could list days on Flex, they okay. stayed members. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And again, fostering more relationships, further, you know, building the foundation of community. I love all of it. Um, okay. So what was, we've got all these gyms kind of, you know, recognizing that communities coming together and value add for gyms. Um, what brought you to this point right now, which we can talk about major launch happening. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not going to use the word failure, but it felt like failure at the time. So maybe, oh. uh, maybe I will use that um, word. Okay. Um, as I said, we were, you know, operating on a shoestring budget. Yeah. And so we had some major investors fall through. Like one was just an absolute creditor who after months of contracts and back and forth, just wanted to totally extort us out of 30% equity of my company. And like, Ser fuck and you, get out of here. I, I, I think that happens <laughs> more than not. It, it in, does. And people, again, this is where that filter comes in and it's, you gotta like lean into your intuition and the woo, whatever, because you can ask all the right questions. You can invest months of time and energy and your intel, like all of your knowledge is, even if you sign NDAs and all this, whatever, once people know things like intellectual property is just, it's, it's a hard animal to protect. Um, but you can waste all this time and energy that could be going to someone that is in same heart space, is, you know, financially secure, has, understands the business and the agenda. So it's hard, but oh, that sucks. But again, learning lessons. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we had you know, money that we thought was going to be coming in and the, the week we're due for signatures. It was, oh, I ran this by my tax accountant, and we actually, I actually need 30% of your company, not 4%. What? And so even though- That's I, more aggressive than Shark Tank, dude. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> it was just pure predator move. Okay. Um, from a woman. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a whole other podcast. But that's no, a lot, that podcast. happens a lot too, where- You're gonna be, yeah. You think you're gonna be your advocate as a female founder, and you know, it wasn't the case. Um, We're changing that though. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies look alive. Yeah. So all of a sudden we had invoices that we couldn't pay, oh. um, salaries that we couldn't pay. But, you know, I knew how much my company was worth and yeah. it was worth a whole lot more than what 30% for $100,000 oh. would be. Yeah. And so I had to make a very tough decision with, no, I'm not going to accept this money. I'm not going to accept this investor. Yeah. Um, that means our team had to um, shrink down really considerably. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had been applying to Techstars, which is an accelerator program, you know, um, phenomenal accelerator program. Um, you get, you know, $120,000 in a three month. Um, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know there was money up front. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, money up front for 6% equity, which is a lot. Um, but you know, we were willing to do it. I mean, better than 30 or 40% of whatever you oh, said for, right. you know, a hundred K. Right. Okay. Um, and so we actually made it to the final round. We made take the top 10 we made top 12. Oh shit. Okay. Um, and so, so we didn't get it. So, right. <laughs> so this, this was spring of 2019. And at that point, I mean, it just, you're, you're crestfallen, you're out of money, mm -hmm. you know this works, like your conviction about the, the idea yeah. and the business, it just never 
never vacillated once, yeah. despite okay. all of this. But you're just like, I don't know. You're like, I need something. I you know what? Something what are we gonna do it. exactly? So at that point, I just said, you know what? Like, I'm gonna take a week off. I'm just gonna take a week off. I I got I rented an SUV with a with the top a pop tent on top. Yes. Just you're a boulder hippie at heart. I love for real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right where you need to be. Just me and my dog. We just went out to oh, Utah for yeah. a week. You know, disconnected. Mm -hmm. um, just totally kind of like let go. Yeah. You know, I knew I was gonna come back to flex, but this was gonna be my time where I was gonna turn off and not think about flex for a week for the first time in a year and a half. Good for you. Yeah. Thank you. And it was on that trip that um, our our first kind of major principal angel investor um, oh, reached out. Okay. And um, it was actually kind of another woo woo moment. Oh, yeah, I believe it. Yeah, yeah. Where I'm sitting on I'm sitting on the banks of the Colorado River in Moab, and I don't have any cell service. Um, and so I'm just sitting there, and it's like at, at sunset, sort of. And all of a sudden, this really like conspicuous flock of birds just shows up above my head. Animal science, you believe in that too? I, I never, I, I don't know. I'll show you my spirit animal book. You can look up birds, like everything's beautiful. But oh, cool, okay, yeah, I will, yeah. 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 <laughs> and so they're just right above me and they're doing this dance and it's so unusual. You can't help but notice it. Yeah. But they just came out of nowhere and they're just above me and then they dissipate. Um, and when I got back into service that ne uh, the next day, I saw that at that exact time, because for some reason I checked my clock at that time, um, at that exact moment, those birds were overhead. Was when an email no, from this I investor. Oh my gosh! Okay, had come in, and it was. I've been watching you guys for a year. This is awesome. I'd love to speak. I'd love to get behind this. Four days later, checking our bank. No way! Yeah. Can you tell us anything about the investor, like background or yeah, why yeah. how they get exposed to it? So uh, his background is 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 pretty awesome for us because. He was um, in his venture capital for a while. Now he's mm -hmm. acting independently as an angel investor. But he had invested in the early days of Uber. And okay. he had also invested in a company oh. called Sidecar. Yes, yes, okay. So I don't know how many people know the origin story of, U of Uber, but Uber was not a ride sharing app when it first oh, started. I, I, know, I know that. And I geek out on all this stuff, so it enlightened me. And yeah, everyone. sure. Okay. It was started by, you know, two guys who thought it takes way too long to get a taxi in San Francisco. Let's just build a little app that, you know, when you hit this button, it summons a, a car to you. This company, Sidecar, was the first one that thought, well, why don't we take the drivers already on the road and turn them into the taxi drivers? Yes, innovation. Innovation. Lyft stole it from Sidecar. Uber stole it from Lyft. Oh, oh, so Lyft, so Sidecar was initial, Lyft was before Uber? They were around the same time. Oh, yeah, exactly. interesting. Um, okay, and then Uber, I guess their marketing was on point or something, uh, and you just saw it, it was yep. way more, um, the exposure was higher. Yeah, you know, for, for whatever reason, probably funding, I'm sure had something to That's do with it. I guess, yeah. But Sidecar was not acquired by any, by Lyft or Uber, they had no merger, they were obliterated. Oh, okay. So... It was really important that, that our investor had been an early investor in Sidecar and Uber because he saw what does it take to emerge as the Uber from the situation yes. and not the Sidecar. Yes. So okay. he already had a lot of experience in the sharing economy. <clears throat> and so we immediately saw the, the opportunity in, in, um, wow. in how, membership sharing. How did he initially see you guys though? Like how did this even get in front of him? You know, <laughs> someone in Denver told him about me and I don't know this person in Denver, so yeah. I don't know how he even, you know, thought so highly of us that he put in the good word. Uh, but, but, well, first of all, Denver's very small. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, just even, like, Jason connecting up, I mean, I so yeah. believe in those things. It's, like, little stuff. When you're doing all the right things, you do all the intentional, you've got the education, you know how to do the steps, you've done the research, and then it's, like, this one little thing that you had zero control over. Universe looks out, or you get lucky, or however you label it. It's, like, that one little play that I think happens to deserving humans, that just shifts the everything. So and it's just, that's, that's huge. Everything, that, that week of me just releasing. Yeah. Just, just letting go yeah. and like letting the universe take over, which, you know, I didn't know the universe was gonna do that for yeah. me, but I was just like, look, there's no, there's no point right, right now in trying to strong arm this situation. Right. I'm going to let go and return to it after like I've had just how'd you but how did you know how to do that like were you getting good at self-care at this point because you like yeah. even knowing that you can't pay salaries like these are very adult problems not that you're not an adult at this point but these are like 
heavy burdens to carry. Like this is huge stuff. So was, was self care and all this like a piece of the puzzle? Yeah, you okay. know, I, I saw how unsustainable um, neglecting self care was mm -hmm. from inve investment banking. Okay. Um, so I knew the only way I'm going to be strong enough to go through these, yeah, these massive blows mm -hmm. um, is if I take care of myself. Yeah. Um, so, you know, our, our investor, you know, he, he not only supplied really life-saving um, capital, um, but his forte was recruiting. Okay. And so he's out in, he's out in um, San Francisco. And so I, oh. I came to him and I said, you know, we are building the next big sharing mm -hmm. app, next big sharing company. Um, I want the best tech team. Um, to build this thing. Yeah. So someone from Lyft, people from Lyft or Uber, people who have done it before, Airbnb, probably not Uber, the culture's not right. <laughs> I, was, I, I just as a female, I was like, oh, yeah, no, by, I, I, I specified wise, Lyft and, and, yeah, and Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah, I'm Yeah, it's my yeah. girl, okay. And so, um, but business-wise, I mean, it's okay, but we, sometimes you can't differentiate the whole situation. Yeah, so, sometimes, anyways. sometimes beggars can't be choosers, yes. but I, I mean, I, I, I really did specify Lyft or You could be Airbnb. intentional, I think, at this point. Oh, right, exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, he, this, this investor, just an absolute linchpin um, in the company's evolution. Um, he, uh, he was connected to uh, John Houston, who um, senior developer at, at Lyft, uh, senior developer at Twitter before then, and at Oracle and Salesforce. Okay. Um, so just an absolute rock star. Yeah. Um, he was he's such a good developer that, you know, Lyft's entire development team is out in San Francisco, but they let him be remote engineer number one and stay in Boulder. Oh, oh my, no way. So he's in Boulder. Oh my God, yeah, okay. Yeah. This is craziness. Crazy serendipity. Yes. Um, and so, you know, uh, our investor Justin, you know, reached out and said, hey, I just invested in this company. You know, they're, they're doing something really cool. You should meet the CEO, Janine. And he said he took the meeting, to, you know, to be gracious. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, hour long, it ended up being four hours, yes. several beers. Yeah. Oh, we perfect. Just... Okay. Were you guys at a brewery? Oh, yeah. We were at West End Tavern. Oh, my Boulder. God. <laughs> Love. Um, and we just hit it off like yes. we had known each other for years. And he just absolutely loved it. And he actually left Lyft, you know, with unvested shares still on the table to come be my CTO. Wow. Could you guys, I mean, outside of like equity or promise, I mean, could you offer him what he needed or did he take it, like take something and just run with it knowing this is what he wanted to do? I could not offer him anywhere near the salary yeah. that he was yeah. getting at Lyft whatsoever, but um, he came on board as, as co-founder as well. Oh, okay. So now okay. he's an equity holder in the company. Dude. And, you know, i had been running Flex at that point for, for over a year and a half um, um, and had actually kind of turned down other potential co-founders because it just wasn't the right fit. You know, yeah. you need to have that person. Well, now you know. That you and now I know. Yeah. That you trust so implicitly and they both, you know, you just get it. You get yeah. what you're trying to do. He was so on board with the greater mission of what we were trying to achieve, um, not just with how we were going to help people live more fun and active lives with mm -hmm. our technology, but he, he loved my vision for making this be a broader platform for membership sharing, even after gyms uh, yeah. or in addition to gyms. So, you know, that ski, that annual ski membership or pass that, that goes underused more than you'd like. Um, museum memberships, amusement parks, everything. Uh, everything. I mean, memberships are so chronically underused in every industry they exist in yeah. that this from day one for me has been a platform play. Yeah. So that this would expand beyond gyms when when we were ready to. But first really nail the gym yeah. industry. Do do the best that we can to make these gym operators and gym consumers really, really happy. So he just loved that ambition, he loved that vision. Um, and he he has been just an absolute godsend. <laughs> for I mean, this company. I, I would bet if I talked to him, he would probably say the same thing because I I mean he probably thrives on new you know initiatives and as investors you know they see stuff all the time and we're not quite an investor level yet on my end one day we'll manifest that um but i think to see humans that are genuinely again passionate what they do they see that they bleed it you know they they're committed to it i don't think you you see that as much as people think that investors might like i i, I think there's still a lot of businesses where it's like I got into it because I saw the margins and I knew what I could do and there's no heart connect whatsoever. Mm. But what's coming through in 2020, I think the consumers deeply discounted and not paid attention to where our young humans grew up with social media. There's this education, if you will, in authenticity that's that larger businesses, investors, corporations don't see because they're, you know, 40 plus and they didn't have social media. They, they're disconnected from their kids, let alone, you know, the young world. 
So they don't see really what's going on. And for business moving forward, this is huge conversation. Mm -hmm. So when, when investors, I think, see someone deeply connected to the cause, they see, you know, again, this play for humanity where we're connecting humans and it makes financial sense on paper. I really think that sells it in itself. Mm -hmm. um, and there's obviously a much larger, deeper combo around these big investments. But it's huge to know that you got into this business because you bled it and you believed in it and you experienced it versus margins and, you know, my family had money and I'm going to invest here and whatnot. It's more just like business play. Um, so it's phenomenal to see these big, these opportunities that are so big come to fruition for people that, that it's totally stemming from heart space and idea of experience of what you experienced. Well, thank um, you. So long, long winded tangent as I do. Um, but that's so amazing. And how crazy is it? He was in Boulder. Just I mean, crazy enough. <laughs> that is, that's insane. Okay. So how long has he been on board to this point? So he's been on since August. He brought his longtime um, boss actually well, to flex as well. So okay. They were together at Lyft, um, Twitter, uh, this, 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 his boss was uh, at Facebook before then and they got started together at Salesforce. So they've been working together for 12 years. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, and John, uh, John, John likes to say, you don't hire the person, you hire their pipeline. Oh, a thousand percent. I get, yes. Yep. Oh, yeah. So John brought his longtime um, engineering director over. And so now um, Jess, he is our, our principal engineer. And now John is his boss, which is funny. Okay. Um, but they've got such a great egoless working dynamic yes. where it doesn't matter if one's the boss yeah. at somewhere else and then he's the boss at, you know, at Flex. Um, and it's just an absolute delight watching them work together. They are wow. so fun. Like they just, you know, they, they're so passionate about this. They work so well together. Um, and we, we were able to raise more money this fall, yeah. um, brought in our first venture capital investor after the family friends round. Okay. Um, and who's also actually coincidentally, they're based in Ann Arbor. Um, oh, no way. <laughs> God, you can't write this. Like, yeah. Okay, I guess we'll have a book at some point too. We'll save <laughs> that for actually, open time. But... I kind of, I actually have always thought I'm going to write a book like 20 years from now. Oh, okay. Uh, and it might be faster than that. I'm just going to put that out there. But I mean, yeah, okay. They can. This could be the precursor to the book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, able to to build out the team. Um, and I, my we're able to bring on my brother actually as um, oh. as head of our business development. He was a um. Personal head of personal training sales at LA Fitness. Oh, perfect! Back okay. in the east, so he knows this game. He knows how hard it was for gyms, and yeah. he's seeing that churn. Um, and he also saw, you know, sales managers you know, struggle every day. You know, they'd be given a sheet of paper with sixty names on it to cold call. Mm -hmm. You know, none of them were good leads. You know, they just get hung up on, or mm -hmm. they'd have to post on their own Facebook walls, and you know, that wouldn't generate Love your own anything. brand, but you don't want to do. Yeah, or yeah. Pipeline, if you will, before that. That's not what it's for. But it's not what it's for. Yeah. Um. So he saw, you know, every month sales managers at gyms struggle to make rent mm -hmm. because and to churn. I mean, they would churn out salespeople every month. I'm sure. Well, yeah. We're, you're miserable. You're miserable. And it's, it's really, it's, it's a hard gig. Mm -hmm. And so he just saw flex, which he had known I'd been working on for, for over, almost two years at that point, um, as such an awesome way to bring new business in for gyms that wouldn't cost gyms anything. So right. they would reduce their overhead, but could be a tool that, that sales managers could actually use as well to actively, you know, connect with their target audience, um, you know, and, and kind of get, get deal flow, get foot traffic in through the doors, that was so much more reliable than a sheet of, of 60 names to cold call. Totally, totally. And the gym owners, I also think people don't understand, they're busy and the last thing they need is one more thing to do that isn't like kind of spoon fed, that like what's the value add, is this the give me the quick, all this extra like leg work, they don't, they're already busy as hell. 100%. So it's really hard to sell anything, let alone just have the time to talk to him about it. Right, right. Okay. And so he lives and breathes the product, you know, when he when he goes out and speaks with gym yeah. owners about it. He's just, he's, they, they recognize his authenticity. Yeah. You know, yes. and, and integrity. And like, look, we, this product was built only because it would work for gyms just as much as it would work for gym users. Mutually beneficial. It had to be. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, maybe you could get away with it for five years, but then gyms kind of come around and say, like, this is not... Yeah, not even that long. I, I think, yeah. again, I think with social media and everything else, and again, our young humans saying, mm -hmm. I know what I like, I know what I don't like, mm -hmm. and I'll speak out on both sides. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it's long before the truth comes to the surface and things don't work. And mm -hmm. that's where, on the flip side, I think people like us... There's this big transition happening again, old school um, agencies, financial situations, whatever, doing things a certain way and oh, and having their partners and doing and, and then, you know, these young, small startups 
with nothing, but you know, young humans are gravitating towards the authentic space where they actually do provide value versus like these OG like financial monsters that we've always bought this way, our parents bought this way. Well, now there's other options. And there's easy way to expose those, those new options to young consumer. So I just think there's this huge shift going and happening. Um, and it's awesome because it's bringing uh, opportunity to younger businesses that otherwise, you know, 10 years ago wouldn't have the opportunity to get in front of future consumers. Right, right. And, you know, I think a lot of people in the industry are familiar with ClassPass at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but ClassPass is... Founder. Yeah, female founder, Priya. Um, <coughs> yeah. I'm very um, inspired by what she's done. Um, she really created some true innovation in a space that hadn't innovated for a long time. I mean, the, the, the equipment and the facilities, of course, those those evolve, and there's some pretty sophisticated equipment in these gyms, and, yeah. and, and, and that kind of um, innovation, I think gyms are really ready to, um, to adopt. But when it comes to a tech platform that can help you grow your business, um, ClassPass was really the mo like pioneering um, innovation of the last 10 years for, for gyms. Right. Um, and I think it's how they just very quickly got, uh, you know, I think there's 30,000 studios or gyms. No using way. Class I knew it was big, but I didn't know it was that big. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unless that's an inflated number that they put out. <laughs> well, we, we never know. We never know. Again, there's transition and things, but transparency always comes out. Right. Right. Interesting. Okay. But I think it, you know they've been around for about eight years now, and and people are really realizing it's it's actually not working out too well for, okay. for people. Um, you know, for for gyms, um, it, it, for for people unfamiliar with ClassPass, so you pay ClassPass at least you know sixty or up to like hundred and fifty bucks a month um, for your ClassPass subscription, and that allows you to kind of dip in and out of studios um, without belonging to any one of them. Um, well, you know, that promises gyms, hey, we're going to get more people through your doors who never would have otherwise found you, and the ones who love you will convert. Well, that conversion rate is very, very low, like yeah. lower than a stranger off the street. Yeah. Um, and they also make very, very low margins on, on their class pass visitors. Um, so gyms are realizing it's not really working for them. Um, it doesn't doesn't work so well for, for users either who, you know, they value being able to go to one gym, you know, that's convenient to home and work, that, that they know. And in your community. Your community, exactly. Yeah. So kind of dipping around to all these different places with kind of unpredictability, like that doesn't really work for users either. It's not right. how you create a routine. Right. You're actually 14 times more likely to achieve your fitness goals if you belong to a gym. Oh, interesting. I mean, again, that makes, the, the science and validated data is always great, but it makes complete sense. Right, a convenient location that yes. you can get to every time, um, a predictable schedule, that feeling like that community. So I knew memberships, I didn't want to eliminate the gym membership. I wanted to improve it. I wanted to modernize it because memberships are best for gyms too. Yeah, It's their best source of predictable recurring cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, so if memberships work best for the user and best for the gym, I didn't want to come up with something that eliminated that. Yeah. Um, I wanted to improve it. Um, and so the result is there's a lot of skepticism in the industry these days about, about tech companies because people were promised the world with, with our predecessors mm -hmm. and they're really not doing what, what's been promised. Right. Um, so, you know, you mentioned earlier, these, these gym owners, they, they can be a tough audience to, to land because they're not like a typical enterprise client sitting behind a computer from nine right. to five who's there to answer your email and your phone. They're on the floor training clients. Right. And they have relationships with clients, like deep relationships. Totally. That's what they're focused on. They're not sitting behind their desk, you know, just killing time right. during the day. So, like, just getting their ear can often yeah. actually be very difficult. Absolutely. Multiple phone they're calls. Busy. They're so busy. Totally respect what they do. Um, and so it makes it, it can be a tough sale. And then when they have this skepticism already about, mm -hmm. who's this tech company? Um, you know, it's, it's not easy. Right. But when they when they learn our story, when they learn that, like, look, we didn't develop this technology just for technology's sake. Right. We and did it. It stems from heart space. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We did it because we see that this is this is helpful to you mm -hmm. um, and to everybody. Um, it's not just another technology. So right. so they really understand the integrity behind this. Um, and so that's why we're, you know, we are doing well getting gyms in the area. Um, well, I think once you get kind of like one of the, it's just like influencer marketing. I'm, I'm here for it. If you saw my other stuff, I printed influencer because at the end of the day, everybody is an influencer. 
Um, and if it's with a major asterisk, you, you got to do it the right way. But if you get the right voices or the right gyms that are community leaders and they see what they're doing, particularly in CrossFit, they'll follow on. Mm -hmm. If they see a proven model, then you, it goes from having to sell it to just you got to keep up with demand. So long as that it works and it actually is mutually beneficial. So I think this is the hard phase and maybe you're even beyond it at this point, I don't know. Um, but once you get that base layer of your community influencer gyms or fitness situations, then other ones take note and see it and come come to you. Right, exactly. And that happens with consumer packaged goods or the brand of socks. That are, I mean, CrossFit's such a phenomenal, um, and I say this as a compliment, cult community where it's everybody looks out for each other. You know, everyone knows each other. They If there's lawyers in the gym, they use them. If there's hairdressers, they go to them. They they trust what it is. So if one gym sees that, you know, Flex is really working for them, like a Sinitas or some of these, you know, again, community leaders, it won't be long before other gyms are like, oh, okay, wait, what are you doing? And they'll just call gym owner versus calling you. Right. And then they call you and it's like, okay, just sign us up. You don't have to pitch it at all. It's like, what do we need to do? Right. So that's amazing. And I hope that, you know, even this podcast is very small, but I started it just because I had to start bringing really good humans doing really good things to the table because I saw so much, you know, not so good. And it was never about calling out the bad. It was about highlighting the good. Mm -hmm. um, so when Jason reached out and I kind of saw what you doing, I'm like, oh, we got to get him on. So hopefully even things like this, while small, are a really great filter. It's like, oh, well, you know, I actually heard her, heard about her on Tour Against Tequila. And I know KO filters out her fitness because I'll judge all those things I've just been in it so long. So maybe that will be one more piece of ethos. Or if you did, you know, a radio show or, again, another human that's in fitness or training our coach is like, we worked with them, then they call. And all those little unintentional quote unquote marketing things are so huge because it comes from like a vetted source. Right. So, um, so it's, it's great to hear that this is happening, um, for humanity and everything else. Uh, but it's also just soul fuel for me to see cause I'm like, Oh yes, there's, you know, this little graceful disruption is happening in these archaic systems. Um, and I love that term so much. We're here. Disruption. <laughs> it came, well, I mean, it just came out naturally kind of like your journey where it's like, okay, we see all these traditional things happening. We know there's a better way. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to find it. And then you just kind of work backwards. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So tell us about what launches we've got, you know, coronavirus affecting everything right now. Um, I'm not an alarmist in general. I do think we have to be precautious and be aware, washing hands and whatnot. Um, but I think it's really important that we keep this sense of community in a time of, um, I guess in a time of need, I would say no one's really, I've never experienced like, I guess an epidemic like this. Uh, so if it's, if we go to digital podcasts or YouTube or app workouts or whatnot, um, I think it's really critical that we keep the community connected in times like this. So tell me about, um, the launches that are going to come up or like what you guys, what innovative points have come up now that we've got to pivot with this virus in, in the situation. Yeah. So we plan to launch our, our iOS app, um, in, um, mid April. And the coronavirus is definitely giving some pause about how we do that. Yeah. Because initially it was going to be through, you know, big launch events. Yeah. Like big party. Fun Which, I mean, party. this yeah. is still a few months from now. So this, I think even in three weeks we could have a different conversation. But I think so. Tell, tell me. Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic we'll have a shift. But if not, enlighten me. You know, I, I think I, I retained that optimism um, that we could kind of proceed at business as usual and launch mm -hmm. as usual um, until this week. Yeah. Where CU's campus shut down. Um, uh, you know, our engineers, their, their schools shut down for a, a month and a half. Um, and so, you know, uh, NBA games, you know, they're playing for oh, no. no audience. Um, and so it, it is um, forcing us to evaluate how do we want to roll this out? Um, because I, I don't think a, a big launch party, it, it, we would have to start, you know, marketing it now. And, and I don't think people are going to, you know, respond to that right now. So, you know, I think um, a more under the radar kind of soft launch is, is likely in our future. Um, but to your point, people are absolutely looking for community these days. Um, yeah. But how that manifests um, out in the real world, um, I don't think people are too certain about. You know, they don't want to go to the NBA, NBA game and be surrounded by 10,000 people. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing these these gyms and studios. I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten from gyms about a up coronavirus update. You yeah. know, hey, we're doing we're taking all these extra preventative measures. You know, we're you know wiping down door handles and yoga mats just you know every thirty minutes. Yeah. Um, really doing as much as they can to to keep people 
kind of retaining the, the thing that makes them feel best about themselves in a day, which is that daily yoga practice. Yeah. Um, and, and trying to ameliorate those fears as best as possible. Um, but you know, they're definitely feeling the crunch. You know, we've, yeah. we've had a lot of gyms tell us people, they, they're not coming in. The, the gym gets really slow in the middle of the day. Yeah. So if we can help those gyms, we can help people who still want that, to, that, that, that gym experience kind of find their way into a gym, perhaps during a slow um, time of day. Yeah. You know, okay, I understand you don't want to be surrounded by 30 people in a class, in a small classroom. Go to the two o'clock yoga class. There, there's usually no one, no one really there. Yeah. Um, so if we can get people through these gym doors, um, feeling confident, feeling comfortable, this is this is still a safe space. These gyms are taking all these precautionary measures, right. and you'll still get that workout in. Um, you know, we think that's a, a pretty reasonable way to approach this this time. I would agree, and I I mean I just know like again fitness and vanity aside. Um, the, the mental health conversation of getting around community, moving some blood, getting your endorphins mm. going, chemical reaction in your body, like the fitness piece is huge. Whether you're going to CrossFit or just running outside or something simpler, walking your dog, that movement is critical. So I, I do think it's important for people to keep balance and it's not do nothing. Like maybe even if you won't go to gym during off hours, like even doing a workout at home. Um, maybe we'll come up to your guys' headquarters and we'll do a live workout on Facebook or something. I would love that. Yeah. But was, <laughs> I mean, I just think it's so important to keep something creative going and keep the community even digitally together um, because locking up in your house, even if you're young and grounded, I think that disconnect from your normal routine is, is really detrimental mentally more than anything else. Um, and economically is a whole other conversation. But I think it's important to uh, find a way and it's, it's a valuable time for opportunity for innovation. Mm. We didn't think this would happen. We didn't, I mean, I think down the road this might continue to happen what do we do when there's epidemic and people are sealed off from their everyday routine? Right. It's insane. So um, I'm open to it. Maybe we will have a conversation around creative engagement. Um, I've got a run coming up with Red Bull Wings of Life. I haven't, um, or Wings for Life. I haven't really talked about it yet, but I'm kind of in, it's, it's an app run. That it's Red Bull's charity. It's their 501c3 Wings for Life, and it benefits research around spinal cord injuries. Um, as you can imagine, there's tons of injuries around the extreme sports. So it's cool that they partner with that cause. And I've got two friends that uh, were injured during competition uh, or you know fitness and lifestyle that are now paralyzed, so it's a cause close to my heart. Um, this world run happens on May 3rd and everybody in the world runs at the same time and you can do it via their app. So we, they just brought it to Denver. I don't know if we're gonna be able to actually be able to do the run at Berkeley, which is right by my house. But if not, I'm hoping we can at least do the app run and people can just go outside and run on their own. Um, you can get the community together. So. We, we might have opportunity to do some innovative things there uh, by reaching out to my fitness humans and maybe we can work with you. And we've got some other great relationships with gyms. I don't know what or how we make it work, but I know that I want to make something work. Yeah. So, and that's great to know about the, that 501c3. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we're really excited about with Flex is um, a, a soon to be added feature or, or capability, um, which is if you're a gym member, you can sell days you're not using, but you'll also soon be able to donate Days you're not using. Oh, yes. Okay. To to nonprofits you care about. So you know, Boys and Girls Club of Denver. Yeah. They get 20 days donated to them. And, you know, they're able to bring you know 20 kids in and, and have a really oh. great uh, rock climbing you know experience. Dude, that's huge. I think that's amazing. I mean, everything. The whole story has been amazing, but I think that is so critical because now you're exposing people that otherwise wouldn't see fitness situations or the, these communities. Um, totally. That exposure is there. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. Yeah, and because our, our mission really is to help everyone enjoy yeah. more fun and active lives, and and we do that by you know through the app by by allowing people to make fitness more affordable for them. Yes. But there are some people that can't pay anything, yeah. and they shouldn't be ignored. Yeah. Um, or people who have mobility issues, um, whose you know typical uh, gym experience hasn't worked for them. Um, really working with those community groups to, to get everybody access and exposure to these really awesome life-changing fitness experiences. Well, if you need um, nonprofit connects, I've done a lot in that space, let me know. I have two, two humans I want to link you to immediately that are nonprofits locally that are like um, kind of help like veterans transition back into life through fitness. Um, another one is around like providing wheelchairs for young humans. Um, because when they get them, they're not usually fitted to them. So anyways, lots of good cause, and I think it could be fitting. Yes. Definitely, definitely. keep me posted on that. I think that's a huge play um, outside of the main initiative. Uh, I will, something that's just coming up, kind of speaking on universe. I just came from PodFest, a podcasting uh, convention, which is 
kind of its own animal, but I, you know, I went there thinking I was just going to learn about podcasting, but the human tone of how good everybody was to each other. Most people are not monetizing the situation like myself, as far as their cast, it's just purely from heart space and what needing to talk about doing things a different way. And there was such a great community. There was a guy there, um, you know, we did this networking thing where we got to know each other and it's like, what do you need? And, and one of the guys was like, I need a computer. Another guy at the table literally deleted his computer right there and he's like, I got one for you and gave him his computer. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, Chris, the founder, he would give away tickets and then if people that got free tickets could afford them, they'd pay it forward and buy tickets. So tons of people were there okay. just off these like a human good acts, like small acts of kindness. So I just see this theme and like now with, with your guys' angle of the nonprofit, I just see these trickles of humanity coming back. You know, in our disconnected world, there's this, these little trickles of us reconnecting on that human level um and i think fitness and sharing and all this obviously it's got to be financial and and you know business wise it's got it's all gonna make sense but on the flip side if we can make it make human sense as well there's such power in that yeah and that's why you see digital workout content not replacing the gym a hundred percent people still want that community experiential yeah. social um environment to to, to work out in um, so, you know, we, we get asked sometimes, oh, are you worried about, you know, virtual reality or, or digital content, like eliminating the need for people to go to the gym? Yeah. And it's absolutely not. It's, it's entirely supplemental. Exactly. Um, Traveling or whatever else. Absolutely. Which I just mean, kind of solves that too. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, even though you can find almost any workout online now, people still are going to the gym. Gym memberships have increased 35% since 2008. People want community. They're they, telling you exactly. They They're yeah. desperate for it. Yeah, you know, especially we as humans, we can lead very isolated lives with our phones and, and stuff like that. So you know, it's it, it, it speaks exactly to your point that even though digital content is out there, the ability to, for you to never leave your home and get a workout in is here. Yeah. And people do that certainly. Yeah. But it doesn't replace the gym. It, it's usually very supplemental to it because those environments are what people need most these days. Completely, completely agree. Um, and now we've got like coronavirus even challenging us more, but we're here for it. We're going to find a way. Uh, this is amazing. Let's, I would love to, um, cast maybe again in like six months or a year. I think things are going to happen really fast, but let's keep in touch. Cause I, I, I have a lot, I mean, again, the audience is small right now, but a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people questioning, like, how do I take a leap? Like, cause these are, it's hard. I think the conversation on self care while you take that leap is so huge. Um, so let's, let's check in. Uh, I'll be in touch too around the coronavirus and what we can do collectively to support your guys' cause. Do you guys have launch dates you want to you want to put on this or you want to wait or just say stay tuned? Well, I think April 13th was our, our soft launch date. Um, okay. We will solidify that and we'll make it very clear um, if, if, if that does change in any way due to the, the virus. Um, but for now, okay. that's what we can so do. So know your calendars and where do we find you guys? Give me website, social handles, all the goods. Uh, FlexGymShare.com. Um, and we're asking, you know, any gyms in the area or stu studios, um, who, who heard this podcast, um, reach out, you can sign up, uh, on our, our website. Um, you can email me directly, uh, Janine, J-A-N-I-N-E at flexgymshare.com. Um, but you know, this is a new, this is a new technology. Um, this is something that we're really excited about that, um, is the change that we want to see in the industry. And, and we're asking gyms to, um, to trust us. And that to trust that we're looking out for for you, not just our bottom line. We're not trying to sell a flex membership. We're trying to sell your membership. Yeah. Um, well said. So you know, uh, really, we invite any gym who, who's interested in this, who wants to learn more, to reach out. Um, and for people who who would love to have access to um, kind of um, the best gyms and studios in their areas, in the most affordable way mm -hmm. um, to date, uh, to sign up on our website. Um, because we'd love to, we'd love to see all of you and we'd love to, to be a part of all your lives. Yes. I love it. And, uh, as you know, turmeric and tequila, no sponsors yet. Everything's pure. So we're not getting kicked back or paid or anything off this, but I genuinely encourage any fitness situation just from a business standpoint, um, hit up Janine or her crew, have the conversation and just see it for yourself, uh, for what they have to say and how they say it and what the mission really is. So I think it will align a lot with. Um, our Colorado fitness situation and our humans that really do protect their audience and their crew. I think this is a very awesome uh, situation that can really add to their business and to their community. So uh, we'll check back in. I'm excited. Uh, check her out. I'm going to be having a ton of updates on what's going on with the, the race for Wings for Life. Um, maybe we'll tie in some things that you guys have going on. We've got tons of gyms in the mix. But we're all just, we're trying to just stay connected while all this craziness is happening. 
Um, but thank you for coming on. Thank you for taking the leap in what you're doing and then sharing your story. Um, I'm excited to see what happens next. Thank and you. keep us updated and I'll, I'll keep the audience updated. Thank you so much. It's been great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time and don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen.